Remember the good old days when video games didn't require a user account and an internet connection to play them? Some of the best times I had as a kid were playing multiplayer video games with my friends on Nintendo game consoles. If you were like me, you probably got stuck playing with a wired controller. But if you were lucky, you might have played with one of these. This is Nintendo's WaveBird wireless controller. And today, we're going to scan it. Or at least part of it. If I was scanning this controller for a customer, it would typically be for reverse engineering, inspection, or failure analysis applications. Since the purpose of this scan is to demonstrate how structured light 3D scanning works, I will not be performing any further analysis after the scan. And instead of scanning the entire controller, I will only be scanning the top face for this video. The first step in the scanning process will be to isolate the top face from the rest of the assembly. Thankfully, it's pretty easy to disassemble a WaveBird controller. All you have to do is remove some screws on the back and it all comes apart. One of the first things that needs to be done with every scan is to look over the part and just to identify what will need to be done. In this case, I can see on the back side that it's looking fairly glossy, fairly reflective, and that will cause problems with most 3D scanning methods. And so we're probably going to have to put a coating on the back side. I'm also starting to think about how many orientations I will need to scan this part. It's looking like I can use one orientation to scan the top side and then another orientation to scan the bottom side. In this particular case, I also noticed a couple extra parts that I had not removed yet. For this scan, I am really focusing on the top face of the controller, and so I will remove these extra parts. The next step in the process is cleaning, and this is something that I do even if the part already looks clean. It's important to do this just to make sure that there's no dust on the part, fingerprints, anything like that. It's also a good idea if you're planning to put a coating on your part. If you have any sort of grease or oils on your part, the coating may not stick to your part. The next stage in the process is to apply reference point stickers, or markers. The purpose of these stickers is to align each individual scan to other scans. Typically, as long as you have at least three reference point stickers in each scan, all of the scans should align well to each other. Remember how I mentioned earlier how we would need two orientations to scan this part? one for the top and one for the bottom. Another reason for applying reference point stickers is so that we can align those two scans to each other. So when I scan the top part, I have some reference point stickers in those scans, and then when I scan the bottom side of the part, I will have some reference point stickers in those scans, and then I will be able to align the two sides together. The 3D scanner I will be using for this scan is the Steinbickler Comet L3D 5M. This is a structured light 3D scanner. It features a single projector and a single camera to take images of the lines that are projected onto your part. This is a blue light scanner and that means it's going to do a little bit better in lighted areas than a white light scanner will. Next I need to decide which set of lenses I will use to scan this part. And the set of lenses that I use to scan the part is determined by the size of the part. So here I can see that the controller is about 150 millimeters across. So I have the choice of either going with a 100 millimeter lens set or a 250 millimeter lens set. At this point, I've decided I want to use the 100 millimeter lens set. The 250 millimeter lens set would make the scanning process easier because you can see the entire part in each scan. However, the 100mm lens set will provide better details on the back side of the part. The next step in the process is one of the most important, and that is calibration. It's always important to calibrate your scanner if you've just changed the lens set or if you haven't used it in a while. Now, I do have to admit that the calibration process for Steinbickler 3D scanners is kind of cool. The scanner comes with several of these printed guides that you can tape to a table. And these guides are used to place the calibration panel at the different positions that you need to during the calibration process. So to start off, we will move the calibration panel to its first location. And we can fire up the PC and the scanner controller. 
The software I will be using today is Zeiss's Colin 3D. If you're wondering why this software is branded by Zeiss, the reason is Steinbuckler was purchased by Zeiss several years ago. Once inside the software, I need to tell the software that I've changed the lens set that is attached to the 3D scanner. After creating a calibration project and moving through some boring steps, we finally arrive at the first calibration scan that needs to be made. But before we get into calibrating, it's a good idea to check the current temperature and humidity. According to international standards, measurements should be taken at 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius. So it's a good idea to check to make sure that we're close to that. Once the calibration process has started, the software will prompt you to move the calibration panel to nine different locations. Each of these locations will have a different orientation. At each of the locations, the software will take a single scan. Once the final scan is completed, the software will prompt you to calculate the calibration. Once the calibration is calculated, we can save a report and we can move on to the fun part. Because 3D scanning requires that the part is holding still throughout the duration of the scan, we will need to hold the part down. This can be done using a number of different ways. I happen to own a fixturing kit from Rayco Fixture that works quite nicely. Another product that's indispensable to 3D scanners is Sticky Tack. If you get the right brand, it actually works quite well to hold down parts. So the primary goals of this step are you want the part to be holding still. You want the part to be elevated from the table a little bit so that whenever you cut out bad data, you're not cutting out any of the data from the controller. And you also want to make sure the part is in a position and orientation, allowing as much scan data to be scanned as possible when the rotation table rotates. Earlier in this video, I explained the importance of adding these reference point stickers to your part. And now I'm just going to add more of these reference point stickers surrounding the part. I just want to make sure that there is no shortage of stickers so that we don't get halfway through our scan and realize we don't have enough. Since I decided to go with the 100 millimeter measuring volume instead of the 250 millimeter measuring volume, I will have to add a lot more stickers to the part itself. Finally, we have arrived at the 3D scanning process. Just like the calibration process, I'll first need to position the scanner over the part. Since I am lucky enough to have an automated rotation table for this scan, the next step will be to define the number of rotations that I want to take. To start out with, I'll use 12 rotations. However, I do know that by the end of this scan, I will end up adding more. After adjusting some settings, I can click the next button to begin scanning all of the rotations. Here's how it works. The projector that is built into the 3D scanner projects images onto the part. These images are comprised of lines. The camera that is also built into the scanner takes pictures of how the lines conform to the part's surface. Using these images, the software is able to calculate where points exist in 3D space. To align each of the scans to each other, the reference point sticker locations are used. At each rotation, the scanner will take one 3D scan. That 3D scan will contain 3D data, or points in 3D space, and the locations of any reference point stickers that it finds in the scan. After each scan is taken, we can see the progress in the 3D view of the software. From here on out, it's pretty much just repetition. The scanner does a scan, I see the data come into the 3D view, the automated rotation table rotates, the next scan is taken, and so on and so forth. During this process, all of the 3D scan data is automatically aligned and compiled in the 3D view. So throughout the entire process, I'm monitoring the data that I have and I'm trying to decide if I need more scan data. For this project, it did turn out that I needed to reposition the scanner several times and go through several more rotation cycles in order to get all of the data that I needed. It's now time to scan the other side of the part. 
the first step will be to flip the part over and to see how I can fixture this part so that it doesn't move and so that I can scan all of the surfaces that I need to. Thankfully, all I need to do is remove one of the fixturing pieces and use the sticky tack to press the part onto the fixturing piece. At this point, I still haven't applied more reference point stickers to the back of the part, so I'll go ahead and do that now. You might remember that earlier in this video, we discovered that the back side was fairly shiny. On newer 3D scanners, this probably wouldn't be a huge problem, especially given how light this surface is. But because my scanner is a bit older, I know that coating the back side of this part will produce a much better scan. The coating that I'm using here today is a mixture of titanium dioxide powder and denatured alcohol. From experience and tests I've done in the past, I know that applying a light coating of titanium dioxide to the surface only adds a few microns of material. So even with the added thickness of the titanium dioxide, our scans will still remain very accurate. I should also mention that the 3D scanner is still able to recognize the reference point stickers, even though there is a coating of titanium dioxide on top of them. Now that our part has been flipped over, it's been fixtured to the fixture plate, it's had new reference stickers applied, and it's had its coating applied, we're now ready to proceed with scanning the back surface. The process is pretty much the same as before. The rotation table is positioned, a scan is made, data is collected, the scanner is repositioned, additional rotation cycles are executed, and the entire process is repeated until we finally have enough data collected on the surfaces we're interested in. After the first set of rotations, I do pause to align the bottom side scans to the top side scans. This can be done by selecting reference point stickers that correspond on both sides of the part. After a set of corresponding points has been selected, the software automatically tries to align both sides of the part to one another. Selecting more corresponding points will assist further in the process. When we are satisfied with the alignment, we can click the OK button and continue collecting more scans. Since the back side of the part was a lot more detailed, many more scans will be required to collect data on all of the surfaces. It's now time to delete all of the data that is not needed. This can be done by selecting in the 3D view and pressing the delete key. The next step will be to perform a global optimization. This is going to analyze all of the scans that we've collected and will identify any outliers. Deleting outlier scans will increase the accuracy of our final product. After identifying some outliers, I typically delete those outliers, and then I will perform the global optimization again. If there are more outliers, I will delete those and go through the global optimization cycle again. So it's an iterative process. You delete some outliers, you reanalyze, delete some outliers, reanalyze until finally there are no more outliers remaining. The last step in this software is to create a mesh from all of the scans. After the mesh has been created, we can export the mesh and move into another software. The next application I will be using is GOM Inspect. GOMINSPECT does have a free version that has most of the same functionalities as the pro version, and there are a lot of useful things you can do within GOMINSPECT. For today's video, I will be cleaning up some additional bad data, and I will also create an alignment 
so that when I rotate the 3D view, everything is nice and aligned. To create our alignment, we will need two or three features that will completely constrain all six degrees of freedom. Choosing features on a part like this is kind of tricky. Because the part is so organic, it can be difficult deciding which features will best align the scan data to the 3D view's coordinate system. When aligning this part, I had to try several different combinations of features in order to get a good alignment. Thankfully, the process for creating features is pretty easy. First, you tell the software what type of feature you want to create. Then, you control click on the mesh where the feature needs to go. Then, the software automatically selects triangles in the area surrounding where you clicked. These triangles are then used to create a feature on the mesh. I did have to create a lot of different features and it did take me several tries, but eventually I found a combination of features that I liked enough to create an alignment from it. I won't cover the alignment creation step in much detail today, but essentially you select the features that you want to use and you select the target that you want to align it to. In this case, I'm using two features to constrain six degrees of freedom. The last step in the process is to remove all of the bad data. This bad data can come from reflections, the reference point stickers that we put on the part, or simply from the fixture your part was resting on. I'll start by selecting the largest portion of the mesh. Then, if I reverse the selection, we can see all of the islands that are not connected to the main portion of the mesh. Most of these islands are bad data that can be deleted. However, sometimes there is good data included in these islands, so it's important to look through the islands to identify which ones are representative of the part surface. In this case, I did find some islands that needed to be kept, so I'll remove them from the selection. After searching through the islands, I can press Ctrl Delete to delete my selection. Next, I will delete any scan data containing reference point stickers that I placed on the part. The previous software I was using, Colin 3 d is capable of removing and filling in these reference point stickers automatically. However, I would rather have missing data than inaccurate data, so I'll just remove them manually. Since this process is tedious and takes a long time, I'll speed up the footage and just show you the end result. When we're finally done deleting all of the reference points, we can take a step back and admire the final product. It's amazing how much detail comes through with structured light 3D scanning. Even the painted on Nintendo GameCube logo at the top of the controller is visible. If you're interested in having a better look at this mesh yourself, there's a link to download it in the description below. If you're interested in learning more about Sentinel 3D scanning, or if you have a project that you'd like to collaborate on, please visit our website in the description below.